We'll look on the screen and you see the title of the lesson for today and we're going to be talking about three words today and they all begin with the two letters UN. All right, and it does not stand for the United Nations either. So you'll, you'll find out what those are as we trek through our message today. But I want you to open up to Mark chapter 1 in your Bibles, Mark chapter 1. And I want to begin there by talking about Jesus' schedule. See, everybody in the room is on a schedule. We all have schedules. We talk about it from time to time, and uh, some of us pretend that our schedules are more important than other people's. When in actuality, we all have the same number of hours. It's just how we determine to do what needs to be done within that confines of that time zone. I want you to look at Jesus' life in about 24 to 36 hour period of time. You got your Bibles open there and look with me starting in verse 21 down through verse 28. And notice that Jesus was involved in casting out an unclean spirit, an unclean spirit. We could add that as a fourth un, but we won't. But there's an unclean spirit that Jesus deals with. And that spirit knows Jesus as the Holy One of God. As you look at it in verse 24, Jesus rebuked him and he said, come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsed, shook and cried out with a loud voice, and he came out of him. Now verse 27 says, They were amazed and questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? With what authority does he command even the unclean spirits? And they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. Now I want you to stop and think about that event, and then look very quickly at verses 29 through 31. As soon... As they'd come out of the synagogue, what he had just done in verses 21 through 28. They went into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John, and they found Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever. And they told him, Jesus, about her at once. She was gravely ill. You know as well as I do, when you have a fever, 103, 104, it is extremely important that you get some attention. Now, it doesn't say that in the text, but it does say that she needed some quick attention. And I want you to see what happens in verse 31. So he, Jesus, came, took her by the hand. He touched her, lifted her up physically with his hand, and immediately the fever left her, and then she was able to serve them. I want you to look at the power of touch with me. In verses 32 to 34, as a result of what Jesus was doing in this confines of 24 to 36 hours, many were brought to Jesus, and he touched them, verse 34. Look at 35 now. This is beginning to get into our text. 35 through 39, Jesus is taking a little bit of a respite because he's so busy. And because he's so busy, he's not had a lot of time to have solitary time. And so when he goes away, the people say in verse 37, where have you been? Everybody's looking for you. And he said, listen, I've got to go to the next town to preach there because that's the purpose that I've come. And it says he was preaching in their synagogue and throughout all Galilee and he was casting out demons. What was he doing? He was touching people. Look at 40 through 45. This is point number one, and I want you to see this here. A leper came to him. Look at leprosy back in, we don't have time to look at it this morning. Look at leprosy back in Leviticus 13 and 14. Heinous disease. We could talk about some terrible diseases in this room today, and all of them equally pretty nasty. They're pretty bad. On the chart, they're awful. Leprosy was one of those diseases. And if you, if you found a leper, it was a person who lived isolated. It was a person who lived apart from other people, and it was a person who always had to have some rag in front of their face when they approached other people, and here's what they had to say. You got your seatbelt on? unclean unclean and people that they knew that came in contact with them would realize that they were lepers and it was an awfully looking disease where you had the flesh rotting off the bone and you had sores that were oozing out all types of materials i apologize if you have a weak stomach that's leprosy but i want you to see what happened in verse 41 Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand, and touched him. Watch this. A physical touch. And said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately 
the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. How do you think he felt? Do, do you think that he was absolutely overjoyed by the touch of the master's hand? Absolutely. Without a shadow of a doubt. Shouting from the rooftops what Jesus had done for him. As he looked at him with this leprosy, he physically touched him and immediately it left him. Friday night and Saturday, we had a memorial service here for a former elder in this church. And it had been many years since most of you had seen Charlene. I've been up here almost all day, Friday. And when they brought his body in, and when Charlene walked through those doors, for the first time, I was standing at the door waiting for her. She broke down. She wept. And she held on to me because of the power of touch. I stayed a little while with the family, and then I went back and I got Tina. And I brought her up here. She came down and sat down by Charlene and she said that Charlene began to cry again and held on to Tina so tight and gripped her hand for so long. I was standing in the back and I had been here all day long. I was ready to get out of here. I was ready to go get something to eat. I motioned to Tina a couple of times. She couldn't get loose. It was the touch. It was the hold. It was the power of the touch. Charlene had her gripped, wouldn't let her go. And many of you that sat down with her, the same thing happened to you. It's the power of touch. She needed the power of touch. It was healing for her mentally and emotionally to experience that power of touch. The power of touch that happened again the next day during the service. I want to tell you what Jesus did in Mark chapter 1. Jesus reached out and he touched an untouchable in that culture. A person that other people said, I don't want to get near this guy. I don't want to get near this person. Look at that heinous look on their face and that skin that's rotting off their bone and, and the yellow skin and the discolored body. I, I don't want to be around that. I, I want to ask you today, are there untouchables in our culture? Are there people that we look at and we say, hey, no, uh-uh, I don't want them around me. Oh, no, I don't, want to t I, don't, I don't want to touch them. Now, listen, I understand what it means to be sanitary. I understand what it means, and I know we've got health workers in this room. I understand that. When I go into a hospital room and I exit that room to protect myself, to protect my family, to protect people that I come in contact with, yes, I wash my hands immediately after doing that. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you this little secret, all right? And don't tell this to anybody else outside this room, but I'm going to go ahead and tell this secret. When I stand at the door back there and I shake your hand, as soon as I can, I go in the bathroom to wash my hands. <laughs> and you do too. But there's something about the power of touch. There are a lot of untouchables within the confines of this facility right here. Jesus said, I'm going to touch you. This church, individual members of this church, are supposed to touch untouchables. Amen? Wait a minute. Some of you don't believe the sermon yet. Amen? We've got to believe that. That's our mission. That's our goal. That's our purpose. But that isn't all. There are some undesirables. Go to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. This is the account of a man named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. We refer to him as the wee, W-E-E, -E, the wee little man. Now, Zacchaeus wasn't a very big guy. And as a result of Jesus coming in this direction to Jericho, which was about 17 miles from Jerusalem, Zacchaeus got wind of the fact that Jesus was coming to walk the streets of Jericho. Well, Zacchaeus knew in his mind, he said, hey, listen, the crowd's going to be so thick, 
I'm not going to get a, I'm not going to get a hearing. No, I'm not going to get a, a, an opportunity. I, I'm not going to get a way to push through the, the massive people that are going to be down there to see Jesus. And so he devised a little plan. He was smarter than he looked, all right? So Zacchaeus decided to get into one of those sycamore trees. Now, in that culture, a sycamore tree had a huge trunk, very, very thick, long branches that were lower to the ground. And as a matter of fact, what people did in that day as they traveled, they looked for sycamore trees because they provided a lot of shade. And so they would go under those trees and rest, get a little respite from the weariness of their travels. So Zacchaeus knew about this sycamore tree. So he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to climb up into that sycamore tree. And when Jesus comes by, I'm going to get an audience. I'm going to get a look at him. I'm going to get a gander at him, if you will. And notice what happens in our text in Luke chapter 19 as we head down to about verse 5. When Jesus came to the place, when he came to the place where the sycamore tree was, Jesus looked up and saw him. Now, I want you to stop and think about this scenario for just a moment. How often do you know people that get up in the trees and they wait for somebody to come by just so that they can see them and visit with them? I thought this sounded very peculiar and odd until I started doing mission work. One day on the island of Nevis, we were going back into this secluded area the building was way off the road I don't know why it was ever built where it was but back in that day and time that's just the way it was for travel purposes but I noticed to my left as I was entering into the building just a little ways to my left there was a man sitting in a tree and I just thought I just thought you know for me from where I came from you know that was unusual but it wasn't unusual in that culture to be in that particular tree. I don't know if Hannah ever had a chance to go to that building or not. Did you go to the building that was out there in the bush? It wasn't the one downtown or the new one. It was the other one. Okay, so, that, so Hannah, Hannah would know about where this is, okay? But, but here, here was this guy up in this tree. And so I had to inquire about that. I said, why is the guy up in the tree? And, of course, I got the answer that I was expecting, and I got the answer that everybody here would expect as well. I don't know. I don't know why I was in a tree. Nobody, nobody, nobody told me why I was in a tree. I, I, I asked people, I said, why is the guy in a tree? I don't know. He, he wasn't mentally deranged. He wasn't, you know, had mental illness. There wasn't anything wrong with him. He was just up in the tree. Now, here, you've got to picture Zacchaeus up in the tree. Here's Jesus going by. What made Jesus look up? Do you think Zacchaeus yelled out, hey, Jesus, I'm up here? Jesus looked up and saw him. And you know what Jesus said to him? I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit. Get out of that tree. I'm going to come to your house, and we're going to talk. Now, why was he an undesirable? If you read the first few verses of Luke chapter 19, you would learn that he was a tax collector. Okay? Do you ever get any notices in the mail from the U.S. Treasury or the IRS? That ever happened to anybody in this room? Has an IRS agent or somebody from the U.S. Treasury ever knocked on your door? Uh, sir, we're looking for Mr. Brian Raymer. Oh, you can't find him. He's in our control room. You know, <laughs> that's where Brian lived most of his life here for the last 12 years. You know, that's where he would be. But, 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 but you're looking for somebody, all right? And, and so they were not popular. As a matter of fact, tax collectors in that day and time were undesirables. I want to tell you why. They would take more than they should, and they'd put it in this. They'd put it in their pocket. And they would pocket more than they were supposed to. Now, as you get on down a little bit further, and Jesus comes to his house and begins to talk to him, we find that Zacchaeus does the R word, the most difficult word in all of the Bible. You got your seatbelt on? Repentance. Look, Lord, if I've taken anything by false accusation, I'm not going to just restore it one time, two times, three times. I'm going to restore it fourfold, Luke 19, 8. Now, where does that come from? That comes from the old law. All the way back in the book of Numbers, where if you took anything about false accusation, you were supposed to give 20% back on top of what you took. He didn't do that. He gave fourfold back. So you know what you call this? You call this repentance. 
Here's a guy who saw grace for the first time in his whole life. Jesus was extending grace to him. He'd never known grace. He'd never seen grace. You know why? He was an undesirable in that culture. Do you know anybody today that you rub shoulders with, where you work, where you go to school with, where you have recreation, where you go to Walmart, Wally World, where you go, wherever you go? Do you know any undesirables? I guarantee you that you do. There are folk like that in the day and time in which we live in. They're just not very desirable. But you know what Jesus did? Get out of the tree, come into your house, and the climax of that verse says this, verse 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. Not certain categories of people, not just certain people, but all the lost. That's who Jesus is has come for. And so what Jesus does is he says to Zacchaeus, you are a worthy soul. And I'll tell you something else Jesus does with Zacchaeus. He says, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to look on your outward appearance. I'm going to look at your heart. Let me ask you this question. You ever judged anybody by their outward appearance? We all have. And we have been mistaken many, many times. We've had to ask God to forgive us because we saw somebody and we thought, well, that person's not worthy. And you know what God looks at us and says, are you worthy? What makes you worthy? What makes you any better than somebody else? Undesirables. They're out there. I love 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7. God does not look on the outward appearance, but God looks on the inside. You and I must never be so quick to jump to conclusions because everybody is a prospect for New Testament Christianity. It doesn't matter who they are, where they're from, what their status is, what their income is, what their political affiliation is. That has nothing to do with anything. Zacchaeus was a worthy soul. So you have the untouchable. You have the undesirable. But number three today, I want you to see that no one should be an unreachable. Nobody should be an unreachable. Even in Romans chapter 1, when, when Paul came to this city and he saw the desperation of, of Christians who were in a vile community of people, and he saw rampant homosexuality, and somebody said, oh, things are worse today than they've ever been. No, they're not. <laughs> Read the first five chapters of the book of Genesis. Things are not as bad as they've ever been. No, they're not. Not right now. Things were bad in Rome. Three times in Romans chapter 1, it says God gave them up and God gave them over because they wouldn't listen. They wouldn't do what they should. But God didn't say, I'm totally throwing in a towel, you folks. I want you to see something in 1 Corinthians 6. Look with me at verses 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Look at this. I think this gives a lot of people a lot of hope today. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. What a list of vile people. But look at the next verse. Such were some of you in the church in Corinth. Can, can you imagine standing up there in front of the church in Corinth and then Paul saying that? Look what you people were, you reprobates. Such were some of you. But three things happened. Watch the transition in verse 11. Three things happened. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You, you, you became a Christian. You reached the blood of Christ. You're now sanctified. You're set apart. You're justified just as if you'd never sinned. You're washed by the blood of the Lamb. You were in sin. You're not unreachable. Nobody is. And then one that I didn't put on the screen, but one that I want you to get in your head with me this morning is 2 Peter 3, verse 9. And if these other scriptures don't do anything for you, Romans 1 or 1 Corinthians 6, which they should, I, I firmly believe this one will. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. 
I want you to write this down and take a mental note of this. This is extremely powerful. 2 Peter 3, 9, but God is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness. Watch this. But is long suffering to us word. Watch this. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know what Peter said through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? Nobody is unreachable. And so we must be the church that touches the untouchables. We must be the people that reaches the undesirables because nobody is unreachable. You weren't. You weren't. And neither was I. And so this morning, I want to challenge us. Let's be a church that reaches out and touches people. I want to close with this quick story. I was talking to my physical brother. He had recently had a small cancer taken off of his nose. And he, about like me and my dad, we don't, we don't take a lot of time off. We enjoy working. My brother should have took a little time off. He said the next day he is a director of communications for the fourth largest public school system in the state of Alabama. He's got a, he's got a big time job. He's out before the people, he's on television, he, he's just, he's seen by people. He said the next day I had somewhere I had to go. I had to be at a school to do a function at a school. And he said that place broke open and started bleeding profusely. And here I am at a school talking to kids and administrators and teachers and faculty. And he said, a lady out of that audience that I did not know came up to me and touched me and touched my blood. And she didn't ask any questions. She just came up there and she got a gauze and she got something and she tried to stop the bleeding. And he said, she didn't know me. She didn't know if I might be diseased. But a stranger reached out and touched me. You know what? Jesus doesn't have to be a stranger to anybody in this room. And I promise you, he will reach out and touch you.